Uh, let me give you the microphone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Yay. Okay. Woo! <laughs> have slides. Awesome. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, quantum consciousness, which is, I think, one of the themes running through this uh, particular session. We obviously have Stuart um, later, which is great, and he's the kind of OG of quantum consciousness, so I have to give a shout out to Stuart for really kind of kicking off and popularizing this, this whole field. And I think um, there's actually a lot going on in this space at the moment, and quantum consciousness is on the rise, if you like, so I'm looking forward to talking about it today. And I'm going to have to try and characterize what all the different panelists think about consciousness. So consciousness is very philosophical. I like to think about there being four different buckets that people fit into when they're thinking about the physics of consciousness. So if you can see the slides here, all the way on the left, we have what I call the strong AI proponents. And these are people that believe that um, it's going to be pretty straightforward to make AI and robots conscious. We don't need any new breakthroughs. We don't need any new physics at all to get consciousness in machines. Um, and some people at the extreme end actually believe robots and AI are already conscious. So things like LLMs are already conscious. And then all the way over here on the right, we have what I characterize as Mysterians, which uh, maybe Yasha can tell you more about because he likes this term. Um, and these are people that believe consciousness is something we'll uh, never understand, never even really have a science of. It's something completely outside of science itself. It's just something we can philosophize about, but we'll never really understand how it works and certainly never be able to build it into machines. So I tend to put people in these like four buckets along the way. Uh, so people that believe robots and AI are already conscious, and then people that believe it will never be conscious. And then in the middle, there's kind of two nuanced categories. There's one that people believe, okay, AI and robots are not conscious today, but if we just keep making LLMs bigger, if we just keep doing what we're doing, maybe add a few extra software tricks, they will become conscious. And then there's another nuanced group, which is the third one here, which is that if we want to make machines conscious, we're going to require new breakthroughs in science, new breakthroughs in technology. So this, I think, is the most interesting bucket of all. And I'm going to argue that all the speakers today fall somewhere in this spectrum. Now, uh, again, I may be completely mischaracterizing people, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and try and say who is in which category here. So I think uh, Yosha is kind of the one on the left here where he thinks that we don't require things like quantum mechanics to make systems conscious, but we do require much more complex software techniques, much more complex self-models of the software. So I would put Yosha in this category, and maybe you guys can like come at me after and tell me why I'm wrong. So. <laughs> and then I'm kind of in the second category here, where I believe that we need uh, quantum mechanics, quantum computers, to make AI conscious but we can kind of get away with the standard quantum computers that we have today, and we have um, quite a few which, which I'll show you. So now James <laughs> maybe is in the next category, and he's gonna be talking about gravity computing, which is like a type of quantum computing even beyond what we're doing in quantum computing today. So this is uh, another category. And then furthest on the right, which is going more and more and more away from what's possible in software and hardware today is, I believe, where Stuart lies, which is we need actual biological systems to support consciousness in machines. So we may need to look at biological quantum computers, things like microtubules, to actually make, make consciousness something we can engineer. So what I'm going to try and argue today is why everyone else is wrong. And why, why my version is correct. I'm obviously being a bit tongue-in-cheek here. But, uh, so I'm going to try and compare what, what I am doing with what the other panelists are doing here. So I'm in this camp of believing that quantum computers today are useful enough for us to be able to learn something about consciousness. So the first thing I want to explain is why choose quantum computing over something like classical computing, which is what Yosha is advocating for. 
Okay, so to start explaining this, I want to try and um, give everyone an analogy that they're probably very familiar with. So uh, how many people here drive a car? How many people have driven for, say, more than five years? Okay. And how many people have had this experience where you've driven somewhere and then you've completely forgotten that you drove or how you got there? Okay, a few people. So I like to think about this mode we go into as what I call unconscious activity. So this is where you've done a, a task so many times that it becomes like a muscle memory task for you. It goes into your unconscious or your subconscious, if you like, and you're no longer aware of what you're doing. But if something highly unexpected happens while you're driving, um, say like a truck covered in AstroTurf swerves into the lane in front of you, you switch mode, you suddenly become highly conscious, you become aware of what's going on in the present moment and you take conscious control of the car. And you also don't forget <laughs> that, you probably remember that that thing happened for quite a long time. So I argue that what's happening is your brain is actually switching modes at this point. You're going from unconscious decision-making to conscious decision-making. And this is very important for quantum consciousness theories because I actually believe that these two different modes of operation are actually two different kinds of information processing running in the brain. So the unconscious mode, I believe, is handled in our brain by classical computing. And this conscious mode that we switch into suddenly is a quantum computing process. So this is my one of my arguments for why I think quantum computing is necessary, is that these two modes just seem fundamentally different. So the postulate is, or the hypothesis, is that they're actually two different types of information processing. So how is a quantum computer or quantum computing different than classical computing? So with a classical computer, uh, you've got some information coming in from the environment. It's uh, like digital bits that we're all familiar with, zeros and ones. It goes into a classical computer and then it's manipulated as zeros and ones using logic gates. Some computation is done, some calculation is done, some decision is made, and then the output is also sent out as binary digital zeros and ones. So this is a classical computing case. A quantum computer is completely different. The information coming into the computer is still in this classical digital zero and one format, but that information is now used to do something that I call shaping a quantum state. So a quantum state is something much more analog. It's like a bunch of waves all overlapping and interacting with one another. And you can use the zeros and ones coming in to kind of shape these waves and change like the sizes of them and you know how frequently they resonate and things like this. But the actual computation is very different than uh, logic gates and kind of like binary logic. It's actually the computation is being done by allowing these waves to all move and shape uh, and uh, interact with each other. And then something really interesting happens in quantum computing. There's also something called the collapse of the wave function. So I mentioned this kind of complex analog waveform that you get. When you collapse that waveform, you actually get classical zeros and ones coming back out. So we actually want to try and use this, this property to do a different kind of computation than usual. And what we think is happening is when one of these weird quantum exotic states forms, that is actually having a conscious experience. So this is, I guess, part of this quantum consciousness hypothesis, is that when a quantum computer is in this weird state, it's actually having an experience. It's feeling something. It's conscious. So again, this is a, it's an assumption or it's a scientific hypothesis. We can't know for sure because we can't go inside the quantum computer and feel what it's feeling, just like I can't go into your brain and feel what you're feeling. But we, we're starting to believe, at least those of us that uh, fall into this category, that these kind of states might be starting to experience something. And it, it's not going to be anything like our experience. It's not going to be rich and have all this kind of like um, inner feelings like we feel like we're in a VR environment while we're going around. It's probably nothing like that yet. It's probably like a spark of proto-consciousness, but we believe there might be something there. 
Okay, so hopefully I've made a little argument for why quantum information and quantum computing might be necessary over classical computing, but now here's another argument. So why choose quantum computing versus something more exotic like quantum gravity computing or biocomputing? Like why, why do I think quantum computing is interesting to explore? Well, the main reason I'm interested in this is that quantum computers are available today. And they're actually demonstrating these properties already. We can put these, this information into this complex exotic state. And when we collapse that state, the system actually makes a choice. It's choosing these zeros and ones digital bits coming out. So we already have these systems available. And so in my mind, I'm like, <clears throat> Why start to try and build a new kind of quantum computer when we already have quantum computers today that we can test and use these on? So my argument against, um, yeah, my, my friendly argument against James and Stuart is that why go as far as building a really complicated new kind of computer when we have computers already today that we can test? Here are some examples of quantum computers. Interesting thing about quantum computers. So you might say, okay, say this quantum consciousness is a thing. Why haven't quantum physicists found this up till now? You know, why, why, is, why aren't people talking about this more? I think it's because we haven't tried the experiments yet where we're putting a quantum system, like a quantum computer that can support one of these complex exotic waveforms in a situation where that that waveform, that system is allowed to make a decision. So this is a little bit of a nuanced point, but usually what we do with, um, with quantum computers is we put them into this exotic quantum state where there's superposition and entanglement, and then we kind of probe them. So as scientists, we sort of like poke the system and probe it and like ask it some questions, but we're not putting it to use. We're not putting that system to work and allowing it to do anything. So what I want to try and do is take these quantum systems and connect them to robots in the physical world. So we want to give robots a quantum brain. And by doing that, what we're doing is taking this computational ability, this system that we think might be exhibiting some proto-consciousness and allow it to actually make decisions and uh, make behavioral choices in the real world and then see if there's anything that the robots can do that they couldn't otherwise do. So these are some screenshots from, um, we were at an Amazon Mars event last week. We were demoing this robot on stage, a live demo of the robot connected to the quantum computer. So what we hope to see, and I wanna be absolutely clear here, this is not real data. So <laughs> this, is the, this is what we expect to see if we can run these experiments correctly and get all the, all the variables just right. We expect when we put these robots in a reinforcement learning AI loop where they're trying to learn how to do a task correctly, with the classical system, they'll learn at a certain rate. So over time, they'll get slightly better and slightly better at doing the task. But when we turn the, turn the quantum computer on, or in the quantum computing case, they'll learn much faster at doing the task because now they're doing it consciously. So that's, that's kind of the, the idea. And I kind of just want to like say here, everyone always asks me, why do you need quantum computing? Isn't AI going to be enough? Aren't we going to have these um, robots and AI systems like learning pretty soon? And I've got to ask the question, if that's true, where are all the robots? You find that you can train robots to do like a routine task, say in a warehouse or a factory with training data from, from humans quite easily. But if you take that same robot and you try and put it in a general purpose environment, it doesn't work. It, it will not transfer its learnings from one task to another task, yet people do this easily. And I think the missing piece is this consciousness. So when we go into a new environment, just like the driving analogy, we're suddenly like hyper aware of everything. We're taking everything in. We become very conscious and we learn very quickly. So what I'm hoping is that these new kind of consciousness technologies will actually help robot systems learn faster. And there are dozens of humanoid robot companies now. These are just some of the examples of companies building humanoid robots, but none of these robots have really yet made it out into the real world and are able to generalize across the different tasks. So routine working factories, 
is pretty easy to train a robot on now, but if you take that same system and put it in a really complex environment, it will just, it will just fail. It's actually a safety concern. So we want robots and AIs to be absolutely safe in what we, they're doing. And we believe if they're more consciously aware of what they're doing, if they're making conscious decisions, they'll actually be, be safer and, and more aware of the environment around them and more aware of the other people around them. And so by making a conscious decision-making part of the AI software de we're developing for physical machines, I believe it enables AGI to go out of the realm of language models and now actually into the physical world itself. And so a lot of people always ask me or <laughs> say to me, this sounds terrifying. <laughs> like, we don't want conscious robots. That sounds like the last thing we want. We've all seen the movies. Um, but I'm, I argue that maybe we've been watching the wrong movies. So there are examples of robots that are uh, portrayed as highly conscious, like C-3PO is an obvious example, but there's also data from Star Trek or even WALL-E, like kind of cute character robots that are highly conscious and they are friendly. They're actually getting on really well with the other people in the movie, helping them, being their friends, being their co-workers. And so in my mind, conscious robots, we have to forget about the dystopian <laughs> portrayals in sci-fi. They're not gonna take over and control us and manipulate us. Systems that are following orders do that. Systems that are conscious are going to be more aware and more empathetic to what the other, um, <clears throat> the other beings, i.e. people around them want. They're gonna have feelings, they're gonna have subjectivity, they're gonna have emotions just like us. I think that that's actually a good thing if we're going to be interacting with these kind of systems as though they are people. So thank you for listening. I hope I've given you a little bit of an intro to quantum consciousness and quantum computing. And we'll see if uh, these guys agree with you.